friends. Today it's my pleasure to um, to um, introduce the uh, this year's Hutchinson uh, Awardee. The G. Evelyn Hutchinson Award has been presented annually since 1982 to recognize excellence in any aspect of limnology or oceanography. This award was intended uh, to symbolize the quality and innovations toward which the society strives and also to remind its members of these goals. Um, in, in lending his name to the award, Hutchinson asked that the recipient be a scientist who had made already made considerable contributions uh, to knowledge and whose future work uh, showed great promise uh, for a continuing legacy of scientific excellence. And that is, you can see the um, spectacular uh, list of awardees uh, over to, the, to your right on this slide. Uh, our uh, awardee this year, and I'm pleased to, to report, is Michael Pace. Um, and Mike, is, it's quite, uh, quite uh, appropriate that he would receive this award for so many reasons, of course. He's an academic descendant of Hutchinson via Karen Porter at the University of Georgia. He, um, after that, he held a postdoc at McGill University. He was at the University of Hawaii, uh, then at the Institute of Ecosystem Studies for several years, where he was a G. He Evelyn Hutchinson chair and, uh, um, and assistant director, and now he's at the University of Virginia in environmental science. He, uh, his CV lists dozens of awards, honors, and distinctions. Uh, also dozens of wonderful papers published in the best journals of, in ecology and the uh, aquatic sciences. He's published across the fields of limnology and oceanography, working on uh, topics such as uh, microbes and communities, grazing ecology of almost everything, uh, including zooplankton, and working quite a lot with protozoans and ciliates. Uh, worked on the concepts of new production and has contributed to great broad perspectives across the aquatic sciences, working with DOC and bacterial metabolism, heterotrophy, allometry, sampling, you name it, Mike's done it and done it just so well and it's just a delightful body of work to read. Um, and that's why I have et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mike's done tons of just wonderful things. Uh, Mike was nominated for this award by also a stellar cast of scientists uh, by Steve Carpenter and Gene Likens nominating him with letters coming from Dave Carl, from uh, John Cole, Jim Kitchell. They said things about Mike that I've listed here, stellar research accomplishments. He's inspiring, he's inspires, uh, he inspires broad thinking in all of us. He's a skilled mentor of graduate students. And he's so generous in service that he makes us all better scientists. He uh, epitomizes Hutchinson's standards and his comprehens a comprehensive and multidisciplinary approach. And um, he's very reliable, a uh, quote there from John Cole. And um, uh, another quotation uh, suggests that Mike is, in every respect, the expression of breadth, ability, and accomplishment that typifies the career of G. Evelyn Hutchinson. I also have some, some personal perspectives on Mike. And um, from my personal perspective, he is simply one of the greatest and most balanced and kindest scientists I've ever met. And with that, I'd like to invite Carlos Duarte to come to the stage and Mike also um, to receive received the 2009 uh, G. Evelyn Hutchinson Medal. Mike. Hello. So, <clears throat> the citation for the G. Evelyn Hutchinson Award on scientific excellence to Mike Pace reads, for sustained and outstanding contributions to understanding of vertical fluxes in lakes and oceans, trophic cascades in planktonic and microbial systems, assessment on co of comparative and experimental approaches in aquatic ecology, and synthesis of the status and future directions of ecosystems ecology. And the award is given for scientific excellence, as uh, John Downing uh, mentioned, but I'd like to add something more to the citation, and this is to uh, recognize Mike as a wonderful person and an excellent mentor, and it is therefore a special pleasure to present Mike with the uh, G. Evelyn Hutchinson Award. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well <laughs> Well, uh, when Carlos uh, called me in November and asked me if I was going to the meeting at Nice, I said no. 
And we said, well, that's too bad because I was looking forward to giving you the Hutchinson Award there. Uh, I was more than surprised. So no became a yes very quickly, and uh, I'm very grateful to Carlos for shocking me and to John for those uh, kind words of recognition, and of course to the society for honoring me. Of course, I owe many people thanks uh, for giving me help, and I can't possibly recognize everyone that I should. Um, I want to recognize first, though, my family, especially my wife, Marianne. Um, and I also want to recognize uh, the technicians, students, and postdocs that have worked with me through the years. They've really allowed me to explore a diversity of research topics that wouldn't have otherwise been possible. <clears throat> I've also had the good fortune to work with um, Steve Carpenter, uh, Jim Kitchell, John Cole, and Jim Hodgson on uh, experimental lake studies for over two decades. And that's been a fantastic experience, and they've been great colleagues and friends. The Hudson River Research Group has been another important long-term collaboration of mine, and I owe much to the, uh, to the uh, scientists and staff at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies for providing such a fun and supportive environment to work in. Gene Likens was a valued leader of that organization, and uh, he was a mentor to, to me for my, during my time there. Now, I like to think of myself as an oceanographic limnologist uh, because I had the benefit of some oceanographic training when I, was at, uh, when I was a graduate student. And then I was greatly influenced by the oceanographers when I was at the University of Hawaii. And so that's influenced my approaches to inland, the study of inland waters. At the other end of the salinity gradient, um, I encountered a, what I would say was a, a fanatical bunch of limnologists when I went to McGill University as a postdoc. And uh, those fanatics deeply uh, deepened my appreciation of what was possible in limnology and the kinds of questions and things you could explore with it in, 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 our, in our discipline. And so those, those uh, folks have become my lifelong friends as well, and I, I wanted to acknowledge them. Well, I could go on at length uh, thanking uh, mentors and colleagues and friends, uh, but I've been charged not to just stand up here and infuse for a half an hour, but to, uh, but to give you a little science. So I want to present two topics of, uh, and, and try to show um, through, through my own research, uh, illustrate some of, the, some of the threads that have led to our current research activities. And maybe it's a good idea to start with something from Hutchinson. Um, well, right there, um, who said that the job of collecting data is rarely done well unless it is animated by the prospects of theoretical interpretation. While such interpretation is almost always likely best done by someone who knows the feel of a wire or a rope when a messenger is running down to trip a water bottle. So Hutchison's talking about the, the need to appreciate the systems we're working in and combine a theoretical and an empirical approach. And what I'd like to do today is show you how our group has tried to do this, or our, our groups, the groups I've worked in, has tried to do this and combine, uh, show you some of the threads that have led to our current uh, work, some of our current interests. So I'm going to talk about two topics. One is organic matter inputs to lakes. And I'll, I'll briefly tell you a story about um, something we learned when we tried to divide a lake up using curtains. Uh, and then I'm going to, this led to a question about the, uh, import, the potential importance of terrestrial organic matter in supporting aquatic consumers. And this will lead up to our current approach is can we use a, a multi-stable multi isotope natural abundance approach to make matters clear and explore this problem across uh, larger gradients. And my second vignette will, will be on the topic of regime shifts. And we'll, I'll briefly uh, tell you my experience with this in the, some work on the Hudson River, and then uh, we'll explore a model that, that presents uh, some early, uh, that, that addresses the question of whether there's early warning indicators of regime shifts. And I'll mention very briefly at the end an experiment that we've just begun to try to examine uh, the theory behind this model. Well, when you experiment, you often learn things. And we, uh, were con we conducted a study where we uh, investigated the interactions of uh, food web structure and nutrient loading to lakes. And in part of the study design involved dividing this lake up uh, into three basins with rubber neoprene curtains, which are located at the points of the white arrows shown there on the slide, or the white lines. And in the, east, the, the thing that surprised us was the eastern basin of Long Lake, which we called East Long Lake, uh, became darker. It became much darker. Uh, the dissolved organic carbon concentration in the East Long Basin, once we installed the curtain, increased from something in the range of 6 to 10 prior to the uh, addition of the curtain to up to the range of 10 to 16, let's say, after the curtain. And the West Basin didn't show that kind of response. Well, the, the reason for this, re this res uh, response, we found out later, was because the groundwater that entered East Long Lake flowed over an old peat bog and became highly enriched in dissolved organic carbon. And hence, we got this diversion uh, between the two basins. And this diversion, this difference started to make us think about 
Well, what are the importance of dissolved organic matter inputs and organic matter inputs to these lakes and determining their differences, the ones we were studying, as well as others, and also whether this material could be an important subsidy to the food web. And of course, this is not a novel question. Others have been thinking about this and asking this type of question. But we decided to try to take, take an approach which would, look, which would look to see whether uh, this material was subsidizing the food web. So uh, you can consider uh, an aquatic consumer or an aquatic microbe, an aquatic animal or microbe, as supported by two fundamental sources of organic matter. There's primary production, which occurs within the lake, and there's terrestrial organic uh, material that enters the lake. And, and this material moves to the consumers via various uh, dissolved and particulate pathways. The green pathways indicate the autotrophic pathways, and the brown pathways indicate the uh, alloctonous pathways, or allo, as I've abbreviated there in the slide. And um, the, the relative size of the arrow gives sort of, sort of a hypothetical perspective on what might be the most important pathways. But we know these pathways exist. What we really don't know is um, uh, how important they are in many cases, especially the, the pathways that flow from terrestrial primer production to uh, aquatic consumers, and especially how those vary among lakes. So to investigate this issue, we decided that one way we could do it would be to, to enrich a lake with carbon-13 and try to follow the autotrophic pathways and, using a model, uh, investigate the importance of alloctonous al al sources to consumers. Now, the carbon isotopic values, the C13 values of terrestrial vegetation and uh, primary producers in uh, lake ecosystems typically overlap, as I've indicated here. Uh, the terrestrial vegetation being something on the order of minus 26 to th minus 30, and the del C13 of the, of the phytoplankton being something in the range of minus 27 to minus 33, or even uh, perhaps a little more depleted in some cases. So our, our idea was to enrich the, the phytoplankton and create a dynamic in the C13 of the lakes. And using that dynamic, uh, being able to, with models, extract or, or calculate out uh, how much alloctonous material was needed to support the consumers. And the next, this slide illustrates the, the results of that work, showing the dynamics of C13 in one of the consumer organisms. This is a Daphnia from Peter Lake. And uh, the, the, the model that was used, uh, that, that a model that fits the data based on use of a mixture of autochthonous and alloctonous materials. And what these models showed in general was there's a, there's a pretty significant degree of support of the aquatic consumers in these lakes we're working on by alloctonous organic matter, as indicated in this slide, uh, where you can see that you know, something on the order of 30% or more of the consumer uh, production ultimately comes from, based on our analysis, uh, terrestrial materials. Uh, and that's, that's true for zooplankton, benthos, and fish. And it's, it's, the exception would be in lakes that are enriched with nutrients, as indicated by the green bar there, where then autotrophic production becomes the dominant source of materials. We also found in this work that there, there is a, a pattern in the relationship between uh, alloctony, the percent of organic matter that uh, support of consumers by alloctonous materials, and uh, the color to chlorophyll ratio of the lake. So color is a as an index, if you will, of the terrestrial organic matter inputs, and chlorophyll is an index of the primary production. So the ratio of those two numbers uh, describes a pattern, a general pattern for bacteria, zooplankton, benthos, and fish. And, you, and it's interesting that those patterns differ among, among the systems that we investigated. And so this is something we'd like to look, to look at further and be able to test more widely. We only have a limited number of, of systems here. And ask the questions: uh, is, is, this, is this model uh, broader, and can we? Uh, what are the different factors that might control this process and influence the consumer use of alloctonous material? Well, this brings me up to where we are now. Uh, we have been using uh, multiple stable isotopes, in particular the stable isotope of hydrogen, deuterium, which has a nice feature that. Uh, deuterium is different in uh, aquatic organic matter relative to terrestrial organic matter. And the reason for that is because uh, deuterium is discriminated against during the process of photosynthesis by something on the order of 100 per mil. Uh, but in terrestrial plants, there's differential evaporation of uh, water, deuterated, deuterated water in this case, in the stomates. And so uh, plants, although they discriminate about 100 per mil, they all, because of this discrimination in the stomates, uh, they are enriched relative to algae, let's say, um, in, in, their organ in the organic uh, deuterium composition of their tissues. So, and that difference is large. Uh, these, the numbers I show in this figure are just exemplary to give you an idea, and, and any, any given system will be somewhat different, but there can be an order of, of 50, 100, 
uh, uh, difference between the terrestrial plants that surround an aquatic system and the and the organic and the um, organic matter of the of the primary producers within the system. And this is some work. Uh, this is based on some work published by Richard Doucette in Ecology in 2007. So we've used this, we've applied this uh, approach to some of our, the systems we've been studying, and I show here just one example of the deuterium uh, content of two, the 2M two members, phytoplankton and uh, leaves from trees surrounding a lake, and uh, uh, the cladocerins in the lake. And you can see that uh, they fall nicely between the 2M members. And there, there's also a, um, a value there for water, which is about minus 50 here. So if you, know, um, if you know the values of your end members, phytoplankton and terrestrial vegetation, and you, you can account for any metabolic use of water by the organisms, then you can estimate uh, the, the percent of uh, support of, of uh, cladocerins in this case from terrestrial organic matter or autotrophic uh, aquatic organic matter. But you can do even better than this using a multi-stable isotope approach. And this is something we've, we've recently we've started moving toward. Uh, here is a graph showing some end members of both terrestrial uh, and different primary producer components within the lake, phytoplankton and periphyton, uh, plotted both in terms of deuterium, nitrogen-15, and carbon-15. So you can see that there's a nice discrimination between um, deuterium and uh, aquatic primary producers here, as I've indicated already. There's also a nice discrimination in this particular system uh, or these systems in terms of nitrogen-15. And carbon-13, of course, overlaps, as I indicated before, but uh, it does help you distinguish uh, 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 pelagic versus benthic production in the lakes. So we've, you've, using these M members, we've developed a uh, Bayesian mixing model that's based on some papers that were published during the past year. And this, this model is nice because it allows you to incorporate various forms of uncertainty, including things like the use of metabolic water, uh, trophic fractionation, and so on. And this model, uh, from this model, you can generate probability distributions of the likely utilization of those various sources for, con for whatever consumer might be in question. And from that, estimate this term we're interested in, allophony. So here's an example of the application of this model uh, to the consumer that I so showed you before. Uh, and this is the output of the model for terrestrial sources and uh, pelagic, meaning phytoplankton sources in this case. And the, 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 uh, the best parameter estimates from this model are that uh, terrestrial organic matter is providing about 60% of the support of the cladocerins in this particular system, with phytoplankton providing the balance. So what we hope to do is use this model, use this approach of a multi-stable isotope approach with natural abundances of deuterium, N15, and C13 to examine the model that I the uh, pattern that I showed you previously more widely. And so our questions, and this is the perspective that uh, from the first part of my talk here, is does the use of allochthonous organic matter by aquatic uh, consumers, these are really questions that we hope to ask, vary predictably as a function of uh, the relative inputs of terrestrial organic matter and aquatic primary production. Does a lochness, uh, consume, does a lochness resource use differ according to consumer type as suggested by the graph that I showed you before? And in particular, do benthic consumers use more lochness organic matter as some of our work has indicated? Um, th and by extension, benthic feeding fish uh, relative to pelagic consumers, which may be more connected to the autotrophic pathways in the system. So these are the questions we'd like to ask across a variety of different kinds of lakes, and we hope that the multi-stable isotope approach will be a way of doing that. So ultimately, what we want to know here is whether this fish uh, is, really, is made from trees or, or uh, algae, and, and sort of really the degree to which it's made from those two sources in different kinds of lakes. And you'll probably recognize that past president of Aslo there in the picture. All right, so now I'm going to turn to the second half of my talk and briefly talk about uh, regime shifts. Um, in my experience, my direct experience with the regime shifts comes from the Hudson River ecosystem where I've worked for a long time with a group of collaborators at the uh, Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. And in uh, the early 1990s, uh, a European invaded the river. Uh, zebra mussels came into this ecosystem and uh, they very quickly became the most abundant animal in terms of biomass in the ecosystem. And since their arrival, they have, uh, once they've built up their population, they have the capacity to filter the river, the river, the estuarine part of the river, uh, on a, every few days in the summertime. So they completely uh, clear the water every few days uh, during the summertime. And they have an enormous impact on the system. And they've completely changed it. And this is just one example of the kinds of changes that the zebra mussel has imposed on the Hudson River ecosystem. There's been a radical reduction of about 80 to 90 percent 
in the standing crop or the biomass of uh, phytoplankton in the system as indicated by this time series graph. So this is a, a dramatic change, and this is, these kinds of changes are called, or are, can, be, can be referred to as regime shifts, which are massive reorganizations of ecosystems that occur abruptly and lead to an alternate state. And there's, of course, been a lot of discussion at this meeting already, and there'll be more on this topic. Now, these may be driven by external causes or by internal processes. And the shifts may be difficult or impossible to reverse. And one important point to note is that the feedbacks that control ecosystems uh, and ecosystem processes are different uh, after the regime shift compared to what was controlling the system prior to the regime shift. So for example, uh, there's a well-known switch between the importance of uh, internal versus external nutrients uh, in controlling uh, aquatic systems uh, during eutrophication. That's the kind of thing that regime shifts, uh, that's the kind of differences in feedback uh, that occur with regime shifts. So the problem is regime shifts are difficult to predict. They're dramatic, they're sudden. And ideally, we'd like to be able to manage ecosystems before they uh, go over the cliff, so to speak. And this raises the question is, is there a way to sort of detect uh, these regime shifts prior to, the, to, to when they occur? Are there leading indicators that might warn of shifts prior to their initiation? Well, there, are, there is some theory about this, um, and it comes from a variety of sources. Um, and you, in time series data, you, you can sometimes see an increase in variance, uh, a, a higher degree of autocorrelation, an increase in skewness and kurtosis, and slower rates of recovery from disturbance, which is also called critical slowing down. And this is known from various fields, physics, economics, uh, some models of ocean thermohaline circulation, uh, climate studies, and also ecological models. And we explored this for a food web model, and I'm just going to briefly present some of the results uh, from a food web model that we did. The model was uh, this, this model here, which is based on cascading trophic interactions uh, that perpetrate from uh, predators down the, down the chain, and uh, where, where there's a refuge for the juvenile piscivores, uh, planktivores, and herbivores in the system. So what we did with this model was impose um, a fishing perturbation on the system, or an increase in fishing mortality on the adult piscivores. So basically, we gradually increase the fishing mortality on adult piscivores. And what happens when you do that is the system reaches a critical point, and you get a collapse. So this is fishing mortality, is represented by the term QE here. Uh, and as you move along uh, the, an increase in fishing, uh, fishing mortality, suddenly the system will shift, and the, and the piscivore population uh, will collapse, and the planktivores then suddenly increase, the herbivores uh, collapse, and phytoplankton biomass increases. So this is sort of a classic trophic cascade response. Now that, the interesting part is, is not that, but the interesting part is in the, uh, the variance component. So here's the change in the standard deviation of the planktivores, the herbivores, and the phytoplankton. And so you see this enormous increase in variance at about the, at the, at, at the critical point or near the critical point. And so is this a, is this a leading indicator? Do these uh, shifts in variance, are they detectable uh, prior to the shift and before the system is kind of committed to going over the cliff? So this doesn't really answer that question. You have to look at sort of the temporal dynamics of the system. And here's a, a graph that just summarizes the, the results for, for that part of the analysis. It shows the, the pattern of standard deviation for phytoplankton, uh, the planktivores, and a multivariate index that encompasses both the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, and the uh, planktivores uh, as you approach the shift. So the shift is at zero, and as we move back from the shift, you can see that variance is rather stable and then starts to increase out here several hundred uh, points prior to several hundred steps in the model prior to the shift. Uh, so that in theory or in principle, uh, this indicator, these indicators go off and they might be detectable uh, prior to an actual regime shift. And uh, another group of investigators has taken this model a little further and just published a paper on it where they show that the indicator provides a three to 10 year uh, warning using this kind of perturbation prior to a complete shift. And that shift, and they also show that this shift can actually be reversed uh, during this time window of about three to 10 years prior to reaching the critical point by quickly reducing uh, fishing mortality. So this is good news because it suggests that at least for some kinds of perturbations, regime shifts might be detectable. But also it it, what, we, what we know at this point is largely based on theory on models of this kind and others. And there's very few empirical demonstrations of, uh, or tests really of this kind of theory. And that's what we're engaged in right now. Uh, we're working on these two lakes, which we've worked on considerably in the past. 
And what we've done is uh, we're beginning a, an experiment where we're, we're increasing, uh, we're adding fish to Peter Lake, piscivores to Peter Lake, which is a planktivore dominated system. And what we hope to do is drive the system through a regime shift over time. And of course, and what we've done is heavily instrument the lake, so we're continuously monitoring a variety of variables in the system ranging from phytoplankton up. Uh, and so with continuous high frequency measurement, we, measurements, we hope to build uh, a set of indicators, or test a set of indicators as we move toward the regime shift. Now we don't have any results from this experiment yet, but, but that's where we're going with this particular study. So this leads to my final uh, points, my final perspective on this part of the talk, which is that regime shifts have leading indicators that may provide useful warnings as indicated, at least up to this point, by a variety of kinds of theory. Um, and, and so this, this really uh, is, it, it fits well with our sort of newfound capacity to continuously monitor and measure a variety of different kinds of variables in aquatic systems. So continuous measurement systems which of the kind that are becoming increasingly available provide an opportunity to, to detect systems in, tr in transition. And so that's kind of the, the test that we're trying to impose now with our, with our experiment, experiment. So how do, we, uh, how do you manage to avoid these undesirable, how do we manage to avoid these undesirable changes? Well, we need to define and detect what the indicators are. So there's going to take a lot of investigation to figure that out. We need to be proactive in, in, in figuring out ways to stay away from the edge and or to, provide, and to, or, and or to avoid, avoid the slow progressive changes that can lead to these kinds of rapid and dramatic shifts in ecosystems. And, we, and therefore, we need to understand ecological capacities and processes that either drive or retard regime shifts. So this brings us right back to Hutchinson's point that we need to have a pretty deep appreciation for the systems that we're working on. And we need to combine theory and empirical work to try to uh, address uh, this very important problem because it, we can imagine that in a period of accelerating environmental change, regime shifts are going to become all too common in, in our world. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. And now we proceed um, to the plenary lectures. And the